Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, everybody. In August 2020, ECLAC, that's the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, presented a report where they looked at the impact of COVID-19 on education in Latin America and the Caribbean. The report was in keeping with many of the others that we had seen, whether it was by the World Bank, by UNICEF, and so on. And it confirmed that education was in crisis. They noted that the suspension of face-to-face -face engagement constituted a major challenge to educating the majority of our children and was in fact widening the gap in education. They also indicated that the inequity and the digital divide that we were facing were not just about unequal access to devices and connectivity. It was also in the skill sets needed to take advantage of ICT on the part of our parents, our teachers, and our students. The answer they suggested was to recognize and work intentionally to reverse the inequities and to close the gap. So we know that apart from the digital divide and the performance gaps, there are also other issues with which to contend. We have seen the loss of income through reduced hours for the employed, reduced possibilities for those in the informal sector. And then there are issues of domestic violence, physical and mental health problems, in particular with individuals who are locked up at home with their abusers. With the increased tension in the family, teachers and caregivers are often moved to deal with the manifestations at school, even without all the necessary professional resources. As you can well imagine, this sometimes leads to emotional exhaustion and teachers feeling emotionally overwhelmed and stressed. And that would be adding to all the other stuff that they have to do in terms of um, hours spent in front of a screen, problems with their eyes, problems with their back, problem with increased um, hypertension, and all of that. I think that all Jamaicans recognize inequity. I think that we're all agreed on that. I think, therefore, that the question is how to intentionally work to reverse that gap and to make sure that all the decisions we make are geared towards that. Closing schools and concentrating primarily on exam grades just won't cut it. Putting in place a plan to improve internet connectivity and broadband access where phase one ends March next year will not cut it. Starting 2021, 2022, back to school without clear guidelines that allow for the opening of schools given set variables, again, just will not cut it. And yes, the recent announcement to face to face opening for children zero to five years is indeed welcomed. It is, as we say, better late than never. The decision to reopen infant schools and early childhood centers, I think, is a practical approach which provides early stimulation um, for children at that age and the necessary socialization for them. Face to face at this level, we have all seen, has the added benefit of providing reliable childcare options for working parents. You know, the guidelines that have been provided to govern the proposed reopening includes protocols such as mask wearing, proper ventilation, aimed at keeping our children safe while providing an opportunity for them to learn. My concern, however, is that institutions must also be given the requisite resources and the support to ensure that they are able to operate effectively. I did not see any reference to some important issues as well that need to be addressed in this transition. As it relates to students who have not had any interaction in particular with the schooling online or otherwise since April 2020, and the major difficulty that they could face in readjusting to face-to-face -face interaction. Individuals who have been doing that will tell you that that is part of the major issue they face, especially for our younger kids. The leader of opposition, Mr. Mark Golding, 
at the annual conference held recently reiterated our commitment to making sure that early childhood institutions and infant departments are able to build the necessary educational foundation for our children. All other sectors we know are built on this foundation, and therefore it has to be a solid one. You know, earlier I started a discussion of where we were with our infants and our preschoolers. And I did that deliberately because, in many ways, the arguments follow the same. In the, same the arguments are the same, really, for the opening up of education across the other sectors. The benefit of face-to-face -face would really be the same. The dangers and risks online are also the same. Of course, it would be even worse, especially as research has shown that girls tend to take on more household chores, cleaning, cooking, taking care of the home, buying food during lockdown, and when they're at home learning for learning. They're also more exposed to sexual abuse as well as physical and emotional abuse. And then our boys are often moved to take on greater financial responsibilities for, for the family for finding the money to buy food and taking care of their parents and their siblings. And they are also exposed to negative influences like gangs and other corner crews, and as we say, hanging with friend and company. We are also aware of the greater rate of attrition in our boys in transitioning from grade nine, all eight schools, to high schools. We have seen over the years that this has been an issue with which we have been contending, and we were able to improve the rate at which boys remained in school. And what COVID-19 and how we have handled it does is expose them to once again get back to that position. And therefore, we have to intentionally reverse that. With no vaccines for children under 12, and given all we know about the negative impact of online schooling, the question would be, how do we intentionally reverse the inequalities in the system? The opposition has previously made a position very clear about the importance of face-to-face -face for primary schools. And as we have indicated, some issues that need to be addressed, especially for primary schools, because we know that there is no vaccine available for them, and we understand the importance of bringing them back face to face. We are clear that the minister needs to ensure that our children's nutritional needs are met under the Nutrition, product, the nutrition Products Limited arrangements, that the minister needs to appoint social workers and additional guidance counselors to ensure that the psychosocial needs of our children are dealt with. And that all arrangements for the reopening of schools and the children's safe return to school, that those are urgent and pressing needs. We had also made some concrete recommendations, which would have included a coordinated approach by the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Transport, and the Ministry of Health in terms of a plan for transportation, which would minimize crowding and minimize also the exposure of our students using public transportation. Because we already know that public transportation is considered a super spreader. So how do we do that? Maybe we need to go back to the conversation raised by the ministry uh, almost two years ago about rural transportation and then add to that the fact that we have so many primary schools in particular um, and the private schools where children come from almost the same area or are transported to school. And so what we would need is just to fill the gap where that is concerned. I think it is also clear in the plans that we had, the suggestions we had made that the ministry should use the plans that were developed over a year ago in collaboration with school administrators, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Health officials that determined the maximum capacity for each classroom while observing physical distancing guidelines. We also suggested strict adherence to COVID protocols, such as mask wearing, hand washing, and sanitizing as well as ensuring that parents and guardians are aware 
and satisfied with the arrangements. I think now more than ever, the lines of communication between our teachers, our parents, and our students are that more important. It's important so that they understand, our parents understand what is required of them and what's required of their children at school. It's required so that teachers and caregivers can also understand the concerns that our children are expressing at home or even some of the conditions that they face that might be played out in the classroom. We also need parents and guardians to have the option of having students participate only online. You know, there are those who are going to need exemption, especially if they have underlying conditions. And the parents should agree to keep children at home if they feel sick or are showing suspected symptoms of COVID. And we know throughout the years that this has been a problem of many parents sending children to school even when they are ill. And so that's going to be important in terms of the collaboration that is required. We had also suggested that schools could look at allowing groups of students to come on the school compound during specified hours to facilitate those who need internet access to complete their work. These arrangements, we know, would have to be carefully managed by schools. Let's look at the students over 12 years old. We start with what has happened in the attempt to get as many students as possible vaccinated. And persons will be very clear that the opposition has been very clear, very vocal in terms of our encouragement of individuals to take the vaccine because we see the vaccine as a first line of defense. But let's look at what happened. The bungling, the missteps, the mismanagement by the government has had a negative impact on our children. It has caused stress with so many of them not being able to receive their second doses. I've heard parents tell me of children crying about will they be able to go to school because they, ha they haven't been able to get their second shot. At this point, we think that the government needs to do the right thing. And that is to begin discussing the phase resumption for high schools as well. In all of this discussion and pronouncements, there are also some concerns that we haven't heard much said about. We haven't heard, as I said, the plans about the school bus system. We haven't also heard about what the ministry could do or is doing in terms of collaborating with transport providers to assist in this area. We are also calling on the government to engage our principals and our school leaders to share, for example, the monthly public health stats. These stats on community transmission, this is shared every single month with the municipal corporation. There is absolutely no reason why they cannot be shared with principals and school leaders, especially for those who have students who come from a particular concentrated area or community. And I believe that that would give them a better understanding of some of the risks that their children would face. Since the Caribbean Maritime University scandal, we have noted several reports that suggest, to say, to say it kindly, mishandling of funds, cronyism in terms of awards of contracts, questions around value for money, and just a general sense of mismanagement and downright teething. And several, at several of the institutions under the Ministry of Education, it's as if nobody's in charge, as if no one is minding the store. The opposition is very, very concerned about what this means because we are talking about taxpayers' money going to the pockets of connected individuals, of persons who are appointed to make decisions in the interest of our children and are clearly far more interested in lining their own pockets. The Nutrition Products Limited saga, for example, is particularly disturbing 
because when we look at the needs of so many of our children for a nutritious meal, when we look at the data coming out about malnutrition, about obesity and what's happening in our families, when we look at the issues around device payments to teachers or summer school teachers, who some of them are still not paid, when we look at the kind of devices that our teachers are using that are not appropriate to help them to really deliver classes. It's disturbing because on the one hand, money is not there to do all these things, but on the other hand, people are just raping the public purse and putting money in their pockets or in the pockets of their, of their friends. This is just totally unacceptable. How can someone that the minister has appointed insist that they are not answering for how they have spent $124 million of taxpayers' money? You thought that answering it would have been one, two, three, but no. It is as if there is no one to account for. You know, in all of this, we heard that the acting permanent secretary has been sent on leave. But is this where it ends? Is FID the appropriate institution to undertake this investigation? We remember in the CMU saga that there was an argument raised and by a senior member of the judiciary to, at that suggesting that the government, that this was not the appropriate institution. And so the opposition is calling on the government to get the proper advice as to where this matter should be sent to avoid it being thrown out on any technicality. But I think we also need more. We need more. What of Mr. Cornwall, the president of the JCTE and the owner operator of Western Hospitality Institute. And these, we would remember, are institutes that have been embroiled in the connectedness, in um, how contracts have been awarded for the CAP programs, in terms of um, questions around the performance audit, and so on. And more recently, there is the argument again about NCT VET in the news. Can you imagine that thousands of young people had their hopes up? The hair was a chance for them to get a skill, to be able to participate in the economy, to earn a living, moving up, stepping up into life. And what they have found, thousands of them, is that from March last year, the NCTVET has not been able to print a single certificate to give these individuals. And let us be clear because the Prime Minister needs to intervene. But we are also mindful that part of the problem is because nobody's taking responsibility for um, Heart NTA and NCTVET. Part is with Ministry of Education and part is still remaining with the Prime Minister. They have to get their act together because this is negatively affecting our children and we cannot continue to abide that. I believe also that in as much as uh, we have heard about what's happening to the acting um, permanent secretary and there's just silence around everything else, we have to talk about whether or not there is a culture of transparency and honesty because obviously it does not exist. Transparency and honesty is not about sending someone on leave that the rest of Jamaica is talking about. It is about looking at your operations and holding individuals accountable that need to be held accountable, even if the public does not yet know about it. In fact, we should, because it's about taxpayers' money, and you should be talking with the public, and you should be making sure that these are items that are in the public domain. And as, as I close, I just want to say that what is required is really proper management and oversight by the Ministry of Education, transparency and communication. I have been on this one about communication from day one. The ministry has to learn to properly collaborate with our teachers and with our principals. It, this is not about coming and telling them what to do, no. It is about ensuring that there is a, a space where they can contribute to defining the solutions and the answers to the problems that they face every day and where they of their own accord with their own ingenuity and creativity are in fact providing practical solutions every single day. 
It is also about prior planning and communication. We should not be here now just talking about how we open school. That should have been done in the summer. By the time September came around, there should have been clear guidelines. Even if it is that we were not ready to open, we would know when would we need to open, what are those things in terms of positivity and so on that would allow us to open. So I, I leave it there as I turn over to other members of the team. And coming now is Mrs. Elaine Foster Allen, that everyone knows as a renowned educator in Jamaica, former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, former principal of the Shortwood Teachers College.